So please be seated. So good evening everyone. Um, my name is Ingrid Willard and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. And it's my great pleasure to, warm, to warmly welcome all of you here, both those of you in person. It's lovely to see such a large group um, after many years of very small gatherings in, in, in this venue, um, but also a very warm welcome to those guests that are joining us online. <clears throat> in particular, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Stan Duplessis, who is here rec uh, representing the rectorate this evening, um, Vimpi's wife, Annika, Vimpi's uh, parents, his in-laws, and other family members. It, it was a great pleasure to meet all of you outside. It's so wonderful that you can share this occasion um, together with Professor Willem Borsoff. I'd also like to, to especially welcome our uh, many international guests that are able to join us. Thank you to, uh, thanks to the, this new technology of being able to have hybrid lectures. And Vimpi also asked me to particularly welcome the practitioners that are joining us from the Competition Commission and the Competition Tribunal and private law firms. Many of, of those practitioners are joining us online through the live stream this evening. <clears throat> so an inaugural lecture is a very distinctive milestone in the jo academic journey of any academic. And so it's a great privilege to have so many people here tonight to hear Professor Willem Borsov profess. So the idea of an inaugural lecture dates back hundreds of years the idea of this is that the new professor is introduced to the broader community. It's an opportunity for him or her to speak not just to his or her academic peers, but to other members of the profession, other members of the university community, and general members of, of the public. And the idea of an inaugural then is that, the, is that we ask the professor to demonstrate his or her expertise, but in a way that is broadly accessible. And so I hope that Vimpi this evening will be able to introduce us to the topic of competition and competition policy in a way that we all find accessible. Thank you, Vimpi. So it's my great privilege to be able to do this short introduction to Professor Willem Borsov, Professor of Economics, specializing in the economics of competition policy. Professor Borsov began his academic journey here at Stellenbosch University with a BCom in actuarial science, it's always remarkable to note how many members of the Department of Economics began their journey in actuarial science <laughs> before seeing that, in fact, their real passion perhaps lay <laughs> elsewhere. In 2005, um, Vimpi obtained his honors degree in economics and mathematical statistics, quickly followed by a master's in economics the very next year. Two years later, he obtained an MSc in management research at Oxford's prestigious Said Business School. A mere three years later, he completed his PhD in economics back here at Stellenbosch University and was awarded the Economic Society of South Africa's Founders Medal for the best doctoral thesis of any student in South Africa, a major accomplishment. Among his other accomplishments, he's a C1 rated researcher by the National Research Foundation. He was the recipient of a prestigious Oppenheimer Foundation sabbatical grant, and he is the co-director of our very own Center for Competition Law and Economics. Vimpi is actively involved in the promotion of academic research on competition problems in South Africa. He and his local and international collaborators regularly publish on topics such as the definition of markets in competition policy, on collusion, and on excessive pricing. Professor Borsov has recently also concluded a long-standing research program on South African business cycles. He regularly acts as an expert corporate advisor on mergers and anti-competitive matters, and is an associated expert of FTI, an international consulting group working in this area. He's a regular commentator in the popular press and the managing editor of our in-house journal, Studies in Economics and Econometrics, published by Taylor and Francis. So colleagues, family, and friends, it's my great privilege to introduce you to Professor Willem Borsov. Professor Willard, Professor uh, Duplessis, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, let me start with a few words uh, of thanks um, to the Dean, Professor Willard, for the kind introduction, but also for your support over the past years. Um, to the current and the former uh, heads of the department, um, Professor Ada Janssen and Professor Andri Skumbi, 
I saw him earlier, Andri, um, uh, for the substantial and enthusiastic support uh, of my academic career over many years and ongoing. And, and to my colleagues in the department more broadly uh, and within the large university for sustaining uh, what I've experienced as a particularly supportive environment uh, for, for, for scholarly pursuit. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and I wish to acknowledge uh, the role of many friends. Uh, they, they know who they are in shaping uh, what Professor Duplessis calls the model of the world, one's model of the world, right? Voort bedank ek my ouwers vir die besonderle, liefdevolle ondersteuning en vir die legio geleentede wat hulle oor baie jare vir my hoopsluit het. Baie dankie daarvoor. Um, most important of all, I acknowledge my, uh, uh, the love, the encouragement, and the unshakable support of my, of my wife, Annika. In one of his famous wartime uh, addresses to the US Congress, Winston Churchill starts with, here we are, together, followed by quintessential Churchillian oratory. Churchill's audience knew where it was in 1941, right? in grave international peril. The purpose of his speech was to offer a different view of the status quo and an encouraging plan of action. This is what economists like me do. Right? With less charm <laughs> and in language perhaps less flowery, we offer different explanations uh, for, for economic conditions and we make proposals for a better future. Most of us here have the sense that where we are in South Africa is perhaps far from healthy. The South African economy is performing relatively poorly compared to its own history. And even if we are not economists, most of us might have views of the next braai on why things are as bad as they are. Right? These explanations include the current international environment, multiple local problems, the past, the government of the day, unscrupulous people, the weather, your nasty aunt, and so on. Tonight, I will focus on one explanation for where we are, namely that competition and the policies that affect competition is a key reason for our current economic uh, condition. Many of the claims I will make tonight are based on research of my own or by others, but they are certainly not self-evident, nor are they necessarily applicable in all ill settings. I hope to persuade you but I am reminded of the judge who, listening to the arguments of a lawyer in court, responded, Jy is reg, maar onthou ek is rechter. <laughs> I entered academia in 2005-06, uh, starting working, started working on competition issues with uh, Professor Nicolas Theron at a time when things were looking up in South Africa. The economy was expanding relatively rapidly. In fact, if ever one was looking, like Professor Duplessis and I, for an example of a beautiful business cycle, the 2003-04 to 2007-08 period uh, appeared to offer the real McCoy with a very broad and robust expansion across all sectors. The economy grew, by the way, as you can see from that graph perhaps, by over 17% in that short period in total. So in 2007-08, the global financial crisis struck, and the South African economy, as most economies, entered recession. The economy never fully recovered, however, with subsequent business expansions being comparatively short and weak, as you can see from the graph. In fact, since September 2008, our economy has grown by just close to 16% in total. So in other words, we achieved over the past 14 years what we have achieved in less than four before 2008. So the question is why? Initially, economists blamed the crisis and its aftermath, but a consensus has since emerged that several long-standing constraints hamper economic growth. One of the theories, and the focus of tonight, is that the South African economy suffers from a range of competition problems. The core claim is that the economy is dominated by a few large corporations and that this limits innovation and dynamism. Now, there are indeed many instances where large South African firms have behaved in ways that undermine competition. But anti-competitive behavior shows up in all free market economies. And the South African experience is not necessarily exceptional, 
with one or two caveats. Besides, the debate around limited competition is not about big firms that might be doing some bad things. The debate is focused on bigness itself. The view is that large firms in certain sectors do not need to compete in key sectors of the economy because of their size in these sectors. I'll present an alternative view tonight. I will argue that competition is about options and not firm size in the first instance. There are many markets where competition is more buoyant than is suggested by firm sizes. I will also argue that in the South African markets where competition is limited, it often reflects an environment shaped by past and present government regulations, or lack thereof. And this has critical implications for us. So, what is competition? In competition economics, competition is determined by alternatives available to consumers. The more compelling the options available to the buyers, uh, of a product, the more competitive that market for the product. So, for example, suppose I'm a potential customer of Take-A-Lot and I want to buy some running shoes. One set of options might be websites such as Loot or, in future, Amazon. These are e-commerce sites which in many respects are similar to Take-A-Lot. They have similar business models. But the analysis of competition cannot stop there. In principle, I might look beyond Take-A-Lot or Amazon for my shoes. One of the effects of the pandemic has been the explosion of online offerings by traditional bricks and mortar companies. So I might find the website of Sportsman's Warehouse uh, or brand-specific websites to, be offered, to offer alternatives. So the point is that the turnover of Take-A-Lot, which is how one could measure firm size, does not necessarily help us understand competition. Nor does the fact that there are relatively few websites similar to Take-A-Lot necessarily imply that Take-A-Lot faces weak competition. So it is about questions about options. Similarly, we do not consider Pretoria or UCT competitors of Stellenbosch by virtue of their student numbers or the fact that they organize the universities in the same way as we do. We consider them rivals because students in a range of disciplines can opt to enroll for the programs on offer at these universities. So uh, that is for that same reason that Stellenbosch also increasingly cares about online rivals. So again, the options and the strength of their appeal to potential students determine the extent of competition. So if competition is about options, then a study of competition must focus on how firms behave to make their respective options attractive. Right. One must consider how firms set change prices or their offerings in response to those of rivals and how they respond to the environment. So one part of my research program with, with excellent doctoral students, I might add, uh, has embraced this view of competition and focuses on methods to measure such competition. So here I give you some examples, some pictures. Some of my research includes how should one determine average prices for products that are similar but are not identical? How do you compare them? For example, what's the average price of a Pirniev painting over time? More broadly, how should one measure the similarity of competing products? For example, do the radio stations Aris Gia, KFM, Classic FM, do they compete? Here, my original training, I must say, a statistician helped me quite a bit trying to compare them. How should one measure the impact? There on the left corner, left bottom corner, the impact of price changes on consumers. For example, what happens if prices for fuel goes up? It's very relevant at the moment. Consumed when, uh, or, or prices of cigarettes and other, other research. And finally, how should one measure competition and market links between different geographic regions? So there's a picture of, of a ship. So in joint work with Professor Johan Furie, we study how wheat, wine, and meat markets in the Cape Colony were affected by ship traffic in the Cape Town Harbour of the 1700s. Uh, and later on, we look at how railways are connected to different towns in the Cape Colony of the late 1800s. So these examples suggest the study of competition often requires different approaches, different pieces of evidence to fully understand the options available to consumers. 
So it also casts doubt on the theory that relative firm sizes, which economists call concentration, can flag competition problems. As I have, as I have argued elsewhere, such measures, especially when calculated at an aggregate economy-wide level, are inaccurate and they tell us little about competition. So why care about competition? So that is competition and how to measure it, but what, what, who cares? So the options available to consumers and the prospects of attracting and retaining the consumers push firms to improve and to innovate. Now that is, I think, clear to most business people. To cut costs, keep prices under control, create new products or services. A loss of competition often gives rise to the opposite, substantial price increases. For example, a number of countries registered substantial increases in the price of personal protective equipment and selected food items at the start of the COVID pandemic. As shown in the table on top, and this is from the UK, but we've had a similar experience in, in, in some respects, the average price of, of, of hand sanitizer, for example, more than quadrupled in March, April 2020. As, as people were buying up these relative to pre-pandemic levels. In at least some of these cases, limited competition appears to have played a role in driving the price increases. Um, also in South Africa, the hard lockdowns limited the ability of consumers to shop around, temporarily limiting options, limiting <coughs> competition in some of these markets. So one strand of my research, and again with doctoral student studies, how loss of competition affects prices. So we focus on studying how much of a price increase is acceptable. In other words, what is the result of normal demand and cost factors that affect the price and that should be accepted? And how much is due to limited competition that might be due to bad behavior, like price fixing or excessive pricing? So, but where's the beef for us? I mean, why does competition really matter for most of us? I mean, this is in a particular market. So I would offer two reasons. First, a competitive economy recovers more quickly from economic and financial crises. Weak firms are liquidated, remaining, and new firms adapt to changing conditions, allowing the economy to bounce back from adversity. This is at least historically why the US has this bounce back ability very strongly, because it has started to have a quite competitive economy. More important, Second, competition has long-run benefits. Consider this graph of private fixed investment, and this is why I have the graph here. It refers to the total expenditure in our economy on capital equipment and human resource development. So it's not the financial investment that you might have in your mind when, when we talk about investment. When economists talk about fixed investment, we mean capital equipment uh, in, in all sorts of forms. Periods of greater competition should lead to greater private fixed investment. Competitive firms cut costs, they develop new products, they expand, and therefore they must incur fixed investment. So why is this so important? Well, history, including some of my own research with co-authors, tells us that in the absence of booms in fixed investment, economic upswings in South Africa are likely to be weak and not sustainable. So fixed investment is critical to sustaining economic growth. Now look at the graph. Over much of the 80s and 90s, let me start, fixed investment levels are flat. But they show a sustained increase here in the 2000s, growing by over a third in that short four-year period that I've previously mentioned from about 04 to 08. One of the principal drivers of this boom was the long-term effect of the government's liberalization efforts in the preceding decade of the 1990s. These included the deregulation of the agricultural sector, removing price other controls, allowing markets to function, opening up the financial markets, allowing free international trade. So all these changes introduced new options to consumers and encouraged new businesses. So it fostered new competition, or extra greater competition, which ultimately transpired in stronger growth from the 2000s. More competition due to explicit efforts by government to implement market-friendly policy reforms was therefore key to the boom in fixed investment. 
As I argue below, the flat and in fact declining investment levels since 2008 reflects at least in part the lack of continued and expansive reforms to increase competition in other sectors which we have not yet attended to. So, how to increase competition? To my mind, uh, wide-ranging policy reforms independent of competition policy is necessary. Think about energy and transport. I don't need to use the electricity example. These are examples of important sectors where government is heavily and directly involved as a market player via its state-owned enterprises, ESCOM and Transnet. Despite repeated efforts over the past 20 years, government has been unable to implement policy plans or has maintained regulations that limit competition or has the effect, at least, of limiting competition and effectively sheltering the SOEs from uh, new competition. A competitive situation in the electricity market, in, in the electricity market in particular, entailing a variety of options for large electricity buyers, including ESCOM itself, would have dramatically boosted supply and solved much of our current problems. So the impact of government on competition, of course, extends to sectors where the state is not directly active. So that's um, so I've given you there a, a, a list of all the sectors where the government is directly involved. So apart from ESCOM and Transnet. Um, SAA, the now Prasa, uh, all these companies that you might, and even other, uh, other types of uh, organizations such, such as the um, PIC, Public Investment um, Corporation, which is the, the government's asset manager. These are, these are government-owned institu uh, institutions, right, which have major roles in their respective markets. And often, in some cases, historically or still, are protected uh, uh, by government regulations. But beyond that, I want you, want you to look as well um, at, this, at the second, um, on, 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 on the right hand here, um, the impact extends to sectors where the state is not directly active as a market player. This is because government policies shape the competitive environment of many sectors through mechanisms such as licensing. So, uh, for example, we don't often think of the relatively weak performance of our prized mining industry over the past 20 years as signaling a competition problem. So I'm not talking about the current improvement in commodity prices. I'm talking about the long-run investment in new mines. The inability of our policymakers to enact any, let alone an investment-friendly or at least predictable licensing environment has kept new players out of the market. When new mines are not sunk, it has implications, not only for the mines, but for the service provider industries dependent on the mines, limiting their opportunities and their incentives to compete and innovate. So as another example, government is contemplating national health insurance, which by construction will create new market power for the state, for state entities, and limit private sector competition. So perhaps seeing the problems of many government departments to implement policies that support competition, you might say, well, might we not use competition policy to help increase competition? Seeing that, seeing that the other policies are not working, maybe. It is unlikely to be successful. Even the competition authorities recognize this. In their investigations into particular sectors called market inquiries, our authorities consistently found the lack of sectoral policy reform to be a key competition problem. It is also noteworthy that five of the past eight market inquiries by our authorities uh, relate to industries with strong direct government inter involvement, past or present. Two others, uh, uh, and, and, and of two of which concern industries that are heavily regulated, private health care, banking. What is therefore required is not more aggressive competition policy. When broader government policies work to inhibit competition, pursuing more aggressive competition policy will not be effective and it may be counterproductive. So, where are we? I've given you, um, even if it sounded not like, uh, uh, didn't sound like that, I've given you an optimistic assessment tonight. <laughs> Competition is, in fact, well and healthy in many markets in the South African economy, as is reflected in innovation and investment, consumer choices, prices, but in some markets, well, in, in, even in markets where we thought competition is, uh, is really uh, limited, such as banking, 
recent technological changes have flipped the charts and allowed the sector to become much more competitive and innovative. Right. So where competition is not at the races, in terms of my title, as is the case in several important sectors, the discussion tonight suggests a pathway for change, policy reform that encourages competition. So is this a panacea? Of course not. But it is arguably superior to other proposals on the table, including income grants, more government expenditure. To these cannot yield sustainable economic growth. My journey in economics so far confirms to me what I had seen as a young boy growing up in a family business environment. But I could not yet articulate the transformative power of private enterprise. This small family business provided new options to clients. It incurred substantial fixed investment in technology and equipment and beyond created job opportunities and prosperity for numerous and often poorer households. Perhaps this is why I believe in competition as a potent and a benign force. I look forward to learning more about this force in the years ahead. Thank you. Honourable guests, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Bosov, your family, uh, you are the intellectual host this evening and also the import most important guest. Um, thank you for affording us this view into your intellectual landscape. Uh, it is a wonderfully joyful event to attend an inaugural lecture. Um, we, together with your family and your friends and my colleagues, celebrate the summit of an academic rank, and it really is something that you can do only once. Um, and it is, a, it is not just for yourself an, an important evening, it is also an important evening in the, in the life of the department. We have a department that is now 102 years old, um, and uh, we have had this opportunity only rarely to welcome a new full professor amongst the ranks of the department. Um, a professor, uh, such as Professor Bosov is also, as you have heard, a dynamic member of the department. He has a wonderful teaching and research record, but he's also an academic entrepreneur. Uh, he established the Center for Competition, Law and Economics, as you know. And I saw Professor Sutherland is also here this evening, uh, his co-founder. Um, and that's a way to ensure that the academic work in the university also has impact on society. And, and it is, to a large extent, the topic of the lecture this evening is the extent to which our academic work on competition will contribute and can contribute to a more dynamic economy as well and not just a more dynamic department. Um, I've had the good pleasure to be involved with Professor Bosso for many years um, and had a small part in his education. Uh, he was an extraordinary, brilliant and dedicated student and my kindest wish for him as a professor is that he would have students like himself. Um, uh, now, he spoke to us this evening from the vantage point of a specialist in competition policy. And uh, it is an appropriate topic for an economics professor because it is, a, it is a subtle and important concept which lies at the very heart of the intellectual contribution that our field has made to the collective wisdom of humankind. Um, our venerable master, Adam Smith, in 1776, reserved his most famous metaphor for this process of competition that Vimpy described this evening. And, and uh, allow me a few sentences from the Wealth of Nations. And uh, uh, forgive me uh, if I read him in his original words, uh, which are less inclusive than we would write it today. Um, as every individual, therefore, endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in support of domestic industry and so to direct that industry that its produce may be of the greatest value, every individual necessarily labors 
to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own security. And by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which is no part of his intention. And that end, which is promoted so effectively through the process of competition, is the rise in prosperity that we had seen and have then seen disappear in the course of the last 20 years in South Africa. So this invisible hand in the metaphor of Smith is the process of competition. It is not a statement, as we heard compellingly this, this evening, about firm size or about market structure. It is a metaphor about a certain relationship between firms in an industry, a rivalrous relationship, a relationship which in the word of Hayek requires that everyone's contribution is tested and corrected by others. And I, and I thought it's such a wonderful slide with the list of companies who operate in South Africa in a way that their contribution is not tested and corrected by others. Those are the firms that have caused difficulties for us over the course of the last decade and more. The ones whose contributions are not corrected by others. Um, this is the subtle insight that we've learned in our science. Um, and this is the subtle insight that we also have to persuade policymakers of. And that's why I'm so pleased that, that Professor Bossop picked precisely this topic this evening. Because the, the need for a more vibrant economy is urgent, as you saw from the first chart this evening. We've lost a decade. After a decade of great progress at the start of the century, we have lost a decade of economic growth. And in per capita terms, South Africans are poorer today um, than at the end of the economic upswing, which he happily reminded me of from our earlier work. Um, to get back there, it is no good for us to pursue um, ghosts, to pursue the wrong policy agenda. And it is the wrong policy ad agenda to try to break up industries which appear to be dominated by otherwise efficient firms. The right policy agenda is to ask why there is insufficient competition in some of the markets that sit in the bottlenecks of the economy, uh, as indeed we heard compelling this evening. And we heard why it matters. We heard that it matters for long-run investment, and we also heard that it matters for innovation in the economy. And again, forgive me for, some, uh, uh, for a, a beautiful uh, archaic phrase from Adam Smith. He, he argued that in these competitive industries, we have new divisions of labor and new improvements of art, which reminded me of your Degas slide right at the end. Um, thank you, Professor Bosso, for a clearly articulated and policy-relevant lecture this evening. Um, you can now see, colleagues, why it is such a pleasure to have a colleague like him in the department. Um, and I wish for you a long, happy, productive, and competitive professorship in economics. Here. Thank you, Vampi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, thank you very much. I have the privilege to conclude this evening's formal proceedings and let you get to enjoy the nice wine outside. But before I do that, let's, uh, let me just uh, give you a few words uh, that will show our words of thanks to uh, Professor Bosov and also our appreciation for the role that he plays in the department. But let me start by thanking you all for joining us this evening and specifically Professor Stan de Plessis and uh, the Dean, Professor Ingrid Willard, for the speak, uh, for the, uh, the, the presentations, and also for the organizers of this event uh, for organizing a well and efficient um, yeah, evening for us. So turning my attention to the star attraction this evening, uh, Professor Willem Bosov, it is really an honor for me to thank you, Vimpi, 
uh, for your contribution to the department. And on behalf of all the colleagues here from the Department of Economics and all colleagues from the university, we really want to congratulate you on this milestone achievement. Uh, we officially welcome you into our midst as a full professorial staff member in the department. So congratulations once again. Just a bit of background. Vimpy joined the department as a staff member in 2005 after completing, immediately after completing his honours, and he finished his master's and his PhD studies four years later. Even at this early stage of his career, it was evident he was set to make an invaluable contribution and um, as an academic scholar. He's technically highly skilled, and combined with his scientific rigor and intellectual creativity, it is no wonder that merely 10 years later, he has attained the highest accolade um, that one can achieve in academia. His statue as specialist researcher and lecturer in industrial organization is well known, and he continues to draw many postgraduate students to his lectures. His lecture tonight signifies a rich and long commitment to advancing research on a profound and relevant social prob societal problem. He has shared his scholarly wisdom with many and in the process graduated several PhD students and continues to produce high quality, impactful research. It is therefore really a pleasure for me to share these words of appreciation with you. And on behalf of all of us in attendance tonight, Vimpi, I want to thank you for your lecture, for your insights that you've brought to us, and we wish you all the happiness and success for many years to come. Thank you.